Uh, so, hi, uh, I'm Helen. Uh, I run Osmond Education. I have been tutoring GCSE and A-level maths since 2010. I founded Osmond Education in 2020, and last year I was shortlisted for Professional, Secondary and Online Tutor of the Year. Um, I'm hoping, and I'm going to send some chocolates to bribe any judges in the room um, to add to that list, but no guarantees, of course. Um, so that's the slightly more serious side of me. Yes, there's the wacky, but I'm coming from a place of experience uh, doing this. Uh, and my thing is all about connection. And I have grown so much as a tutor in the last two, three years since I've been able to connect to other tutors. And from that, uh, really developed my skills. So I found this quote on LinkedIn. Uh, connecting is all about nurturing genuine, meaningful relationships. It's about getting to know people on a personal level, understanding their passions, goals, dreams. It's about empathizing, supporting, and being there for one another, not just when you need something, but because you genuinely care. Now, that doesn't have to be everybody, because we can't do it. But if you can connect on some level, then you are already in a better place than where you started. So we're going to look at three areas. Uh, connecting with students, connecting with parents, and connecting with other tutors. And we're going to do it in that order because I'm a mathematician and I like things to be logical. So, connecting with students, why do we do it? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the chat. Um, somebody might have to yell at me if I miss any because I'm juggling screens. Um, but why do you think it's important for us as tutors to connect with our students? Any thoughts? Apart from it pays the bills. Yes, there is definitely an element of it pays the bills. Um, yeah, uh, positive about their tuition, feel motivated, more productive, beyond the academia, safe and secure, best how to teach them, build trust. I'm loving all of these. In fact, I'm going to stop because you've just done this bit for me. Um, security and motivation. I'm loving all of these. Um, yeah, these are great. Uh, so I got, when I went through this and thought this through, it supports their self-esteem. Students are happier, they're way more comfortable if they know we genuinely care about them and their well-being. It helps with their motivation. Students are way more likely to engage for those who believe in them. It allows for a safe place for if a safeguarding disclosure needs to be made. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen in every tuition environment, but if there is a connection between you and your student, if there is an issue, if there is a safeguarding thing that needs to happen, then you can be a safe place for that to be done. Again, not the only place for them to come to, but it allows for it to be done. Um, and because it builds trust between us and the student. When the tr student trusts us, they feel relaxed, they feel comfortable, they might even be prepared to take a step further than where they were before. If they trust that we can take them from what they don't know, so from what they do know to what they don't know, then we've got learning, we've got growth. Um, Rachel Botsman is a expert on trust, just more broadly, not in education. But trust allows us to navigate uncertainty. We can place our faith in others and take leaps into the unknown. We can take leaps from what they do know into what they don't. We can take them from the basic steps of algebra into factorizing, into quadratics, and away we go. I know that's me as a mathematician speaking there. Um, great question in the chat. What if they don't do their homework? turn up late, would you advise informing this parent may not be popular with? Yeah, actually, I think that's, personally, that's a judgment call and depends on your expectations of homework and turning up late. Uh, turning up late, I would be telling the parents um, because of a safeguarding issue in case there's something else happening, just so that they're aware. Um, doesn't need to be a big deal, just a little. They were late today, um, it happened. Uh, just if you can encourage them to be on time next time. It doesn't need to be a big thing. Um, but just keep it as a, as a small thing. And obviously, if they are regularly turning up late, then you can flag it more. Uh, 
I'm actually not a massive fan of homework intuition. I will give it where appropriate. But if that's part of what you are doing, then yes, then you need to be telling the parent. That's point two. Can I get to, <laughs> I can get to point two in a minute? Um, that will help with connecting with the parents as well. Um, anyone got any thoughts on any of those? Any of them that strike uh, to you, strike with you that you hadn't thought about before? Or uh, anything that uh, resonates with you, that you find true in your own uh, situations as tutors? This is where I wait awkwardly to see if anything comes up in the chat. Okay, nothing coming up yet, but do do feel free to shout if there's anything. Um, so that's why. How do we do it? How do we connect with our students? Here's a few ideas. Don't have to do them all. Some of them will work just be now and then, but you can include these hopefully within your uh, tuition. Um, you can truly care. It's not unprofessional to care about your students. You can rejoice when they get the good results, commiserate when they get the bad ones. There is a limit there. I'm going to put the, the qualification there. There is a limit. You do have to let it go. You do have to have boundaries. You can, yeah, it's the judgment that you make in how to respond to things like that that is your professionalism it's okay to show that you care but you do need to let it go when the working day is done you can't invest too much into your students that's just it's a step too far so yeah it's a judgment that you make and the actions that you take in that that is the professionalism so feel free to care about your students their results what's important to them um this one came up actually i was reading a send uh thing understand a student's comfort zone and respect it now particularly if you have a student that's got an additional need but it does work for all students learn where they are comfortable watch for them not being comfortable and if they're not comfortable give them the time the space the support that they need to do that to get comfortable part of our job is to push them out of their comfort zone into the new learning but if we if they're really uncomfortable, then the learning's not going to happen. So again, particularly if you've got somebody that's got sensory issues or needs movement breaks, things like that, it's okay. Use their comfort zone, respect it. When you've got that trust, you can then move them on from it. Um, another one, and I'm incredibly guilty of this one, uh, I have to tell myself to stop. Listen, don't jump to correct them. Now, the one that comes up a whole host when I see this one is students that come to me and say, I'm terrible at maths. And the instinct is to say, no, you're not. Now, that might sound encouraging, but it could be interpreted as, I don't believe you. And that breaks down the trust. So, and a student in that situation needs us to believe them, believe their words. You can challenge them, things like, why do you think you're bad at maths? but uh, draw them into reasoning it through, not a complete correction of uh, invalidating their feelings of, I'm bad at maths, no, you're not. Just something to think about with that one. Um, and I know this, <laughs> this is do as I say, not do as I, <laughs> not do as I do, because I'm terribly bad at jumping in there um, on that one. It's so instinctive to say, no, you're not. Um, and some students that's gonna be fine with, but others, it's not going to work so well. So just try and challenge the uh, misconceptions, the reasonings, why they think it is, rather than jumping in to correct them. Um, be authentic. Be you. Be you. Uh, as you might have noticed from right at the beginning, I am a little quirky. I stood on a glacier in flip flops. If I try and not be quirky in a session, that's going to be very obvious to my students that I'm not comfortable in where I am. Just be you. They can tell when we're pretending putting on a front. You are a human being as well. You can show some elements of who you are. Now, again, use your professional judgment on this one. Don't tell them, share things that aren't appropriate. Um, but some personal details are okay. Most of my students know that I am the mother of two. Um, the ones that come in here in lessons meet my kids. 
um, just at the door, they come and pull funny faces just at the start. That's okay. I wouldn't tell them anything about my kids that's not appropriate. They also know I like Lego. Those that are online, I think it's fairly clear there's a, there's a reasonable about uh, around me. It makes a conversation point. It's something that makes me human and not just a face on the other side of the screen. And that can be really helpful to uh, develop their, uh, their, communi their trust in you, their relationship with you. Um, tell them when they've done something good. And that's tell them, students, when they've done something good. Instinct is to go and tell the parents in a report something, she did a really good day today. But the, the student needs to hear it too. They need to hear the positives um, around what they've done that's good. Highlight those positives. Don't not say the, the negatives, the things that they need to work on, because that's part of it, but really highlight the positives. Again, if you've got somebody with additional need, they're not going to necessarily pick up verb, non-verbal and social cues from you. They're not going to necessarily see when you're smiling and you're praising them without the words. And in fact, some of them will have struggled with that through their education career. They might not have had that many positive words and they really need to hear it as well as see the social and uh, non-verbal cues. So that's OK. You can tell them when they've done something good, but tell the student as well as the parent. Uh, and another one here, work out how to accommodate their needs. If you have a child that's got an additional need, whether that's diagnosed or not, whatever that need is, try and include it in your tuition. However you're doing it, try and accommodate their needs. Um, it shows you care about them and what they need. It shows that you are listening to what they're telling you. So they don't have to be big things. It could be brain breaks. It could be movement breaks. If you've got a, a student with ADHD, they might need to get up and move around for a few minutes. Um, if you've got a student with dyslexia, some of them find different colored paper, uh, different screen cut backgrounds helpful. So make those accommodations where you can. Obviously, these are needs, not wants. These are things that the student need to be able to learn. So it doesn't have to be whatever they want, but the things that are going to make it work. Uh, some great things in the chat here. Um, there's a balance between allowing them to feel comfortable and maintaining respectful relationships. Uh, positive relationships help when needing to have those difficult conversations. So if you've got a good positive relationship with the student and with the parents, point two coming in a minute, um, your message is coming then from a place of understanding and trust. Um, yeah, uh, what is your evidence for point uh, three in there? Uh, one that loves working on the floor. Fantastic. If that's how she works, work on the floor. It, we're not within the structures of school where they have to be sat at a desk or whatever. Whatever they need, as long as you can accommodate it, fantastic. Uh, a couple more hows. Um, so this is easy one. This is one of my big ones. Check in at the start of the session. A very quick, how are you doing today? How's school gone? What were you learning today? That sort of just 30 seconds check in at the beginning, because if it's going to be a bad day, you might want to pivot and change your plan slightly. You might want to reduce what you're doing with your tuition. Um, if they've had a bad day, they might not be in a place to learn and you have to spend some time investing in getting them there before you can carry out any learning. If they've had a great day, then you can build on that enthusiasm. So that is a really useful little start thing. And as your students get to know you, they might tell you stuff about other subjects. And that's fine. It's getting to know them. It's getting to know them as a person. Uh, another one. Remember the key dates and important things to the student. If they tell you that their birthday is coming up, then make a note of when it is and wish them a happy birthday. Uh, if they are performing in a school concert, make a note somewhere and just say, how did it go at the start of the next lesson? If they've got family events or sporting things, anything that is important to the student, try and remember those details so that you can ask them about them. It shows that you really care about them um, as a person and that they respond well to knowing that you've remembered. You have remembered something that they've wanted to tell you and you've come back and asked them about it. It really helps with building that connection between them. Uh, try and relate your content 
to their interests. Now, it doesn't work all the time, but if you have a child that is football mad, as many are, um, I have linked averages and probability to the Premier League football tables. I know nothing about football. I am not a football person, but because it interests them, that's where I've gone. I've found the tables. We've gone and found probability from it using those resources. Uh, food is another great one. I teach fractions and, yeah, lots of fractions, lots of ratio, Smarties, pizza, cake, any of those sorts of things. It engages students with their with things that they interest them. Now, it's their interests. I have a student had a student with a food disorder. I wouldn't use food to teach in that context. So personalize it to that class. If you are aware that there is something that you that you shouldn't be teaching, relating it to, don't use it. But if you know that there's an interest in football, an interest in, oh goodness knows, <laughs> especially with the humanities, you can definitely go and do a lot that's uh, related to their interests. Um, lots of fortnight related English maths exercises on tests, which helps with teenage boys. Uh, I assume Fortnite is a game. Yeah. Uh, YouTube, gaming. If you can use those, fantastic. Brilliant. They really help make it relevant to a student and makes it engaging for a student. Uh, make it a safe space to take risks and make mistakes. We learn from our mistakes. In fact, we learn probably most from our mistakes. The things that we do wrong, we learn from because we learn not to do them again. So make it a safe space in your lessons to take risks, to make those mistakes, perhaps even make your own mistakes. Uh, my favorite is telling that I did two times three and got five on a degree level piece of coursework. Was not a good moment, that one. Complicated bit of maths, but did the two times three and got five. And students laugh at me for that, but it makes it a safe space for them to make a similar mistake. It's okay to make mistakes. Uh, yeah, we've already talked about this a little bit. You can share a little bit about yourself. Doesn't need to be much. The small details, the, the little things, what you're interested in. I'm going to the football this weekend. I'm going to the theater. Uh, I like building Lego, anything like that. It's a little something, nothing too personal, but just little things so that you are a human being and not a authoritarian teacher looking, looking down on them. You're not a face on a screen if you're an online tutor. There's, that just makes you human. Uh, we're building trust so that they can trust us to take steps into what we don't understand. So that's my kind of my thoughts around connecting with students and why it's so important and how we can do it. Just some small ideas there. I hope that some of them are helpful. If you've got any other thoughts you want to do, stick in the chat before we move on to number two. I can count. You'd hope I could count being a math tutor. Just give it a minute for any messages to come through. Okay. Uh, next one on my list then is connecting with parents. Now, parents often don't know much about tutoring. Their experience of education is school. So sometimes we need to turn up as a professional, as like a consultant, like an experienced tutor. We need to show what the expectation is to parents. Sometimes we need to drop that formality and we need to be relatable, sharing what has worked, what hasn't worked, what might have worked with our own children or other students. Particularly the higher up you go, if you're getting GCSE and A-level students, often the parents don't understand the level that you're dealing with. They don't remember it from their own days. So being able to share what's worked before can really help. So, oh, hold on, that's the wrong button. That we go. Why should we connect with the parents as well as the student? What's important about connecting with the parents? Any thoughts in the chat before I hit my uh, ones, my list? All right, I'm looking at two screens, which is why I'm a bit back and forth. Yeah, they know children better than we do. They pay the bills and need to trust you. Uh, they need support too. They need to continue your mission away from the sessions. They are your customer. 
and need you need to look after them and provide a great service absolutely all of those uh, people buy from people they pay help you understand their starting point they're often tricky in the kids yes oh yes so definitely you can get some parents that are trickier than the kids so that the student knows that you're all connected it's a three-way conversation uh yeah brilliant so i kind of summarize this in sort of I think I've got four points. Uh, connecting with parents allows you to communicate and clarify your expectations as the tutor and their expectations of what you are offering. Things like how much are sessions, when and how they pay, whether you have a homework policy and what it is. So that ties into the question that we had before. If you have a homework policy, you make it clear to the parent and the child, then if it deviates, the expectation is clear. This is what I expect from the start. Um, cancellation policy. I think this is one of the biggest one I see in Facebook groups is what's your cancellation policy? How do you handle if students don't turn up? If you've got it clear from the start, then that is a really helpful. You can refer back to it as at the start. It's 48 hours to cancel. It's 24 hours to cancel. That sort of expectation. You can refer back to what you started with. Uh, other things where the links are if you're online or links for resources if you are using them um, and also how they communicate with you as a, the tutor if they've got information that they need to pass to you uh, or feedback that they need to pass to you how do they get hold of you we're not all attached to our computers our phones all the time we need to have our downtime so if you can set the expectation i will respond to queries at this point of the day you can email me and i will get back to you at this point then that sets the expectation. This is where we're at. This is what I expect. This is what you can expect. And then you've got something to refer back to. Um, they are, as we've already said in the chat, they are the experts in their child. They have known them since they were born. They've lived with them. They know what their child is like. And they also have a lot of influence over their child. So, Firstly, they know their needs, their interests. Again, if you've got a SEND child uh, or even one that's not got a diagnosis but works in a certain way, then the parents can tell you that. If you have connected with the parents to start with, then you can use their knowledge, their expertise in their child to be able to plan your sessions to accommodate their needs, as we talked about in the first one. The second part, if a student can see that the parent respects you as a tutor, then that can improve the relationship with the student as well. It's not that the student can go to the parent and say, I didn't do this or I don't like them. If the parent is respecting you as a tutor, then that's influence that they can put onto the child. Not bad influence, but a respect almost that's shown between the parent to the tutor can then be mirrored by the student and the tutor. Um, it's going to sound like a great one. They'll pass your name on to other parents. It's that great service that we're offering. If you offer a great service to them, they will tell other parents about you, the school gate phenomenon. And believe, I know this from my own school day, uh, school gate experiences. When I pick up my children from school, there are conversations that go on. Do you know somebody that can help with this? Yes, that's exactly how it works. And it might be a couple of degrees of separation, but if parents are connected with you, they know you're offering a great service, they will then pass your name on. Most of my work comes from word of mouth. It comes from other parents recommending me. One of the biggest forms. So if you've got a good connection with the parent, that can really help with them passing on. Uh, caveat, you are the expert in your subject. You are the expert in maths, English, 11 plus, modern foreign languages, whatever it is you tutor, you are the expert in the subject and you are the expert in tutoring. You are the pedagogy expert in the room, in most cases. You are the one setting how you are doing your tuition and that comes with the clarifying and communicating those expectations. Don't let them sway you and us saying, well, why aren't you doing this? Actually, no, I know that we're not ready for that topic yet because I'm the expert. They are the expert in their child. You are the expert in your subject. So don't let them sway them. Uh, I've got, a, yeah, no, take care of parental anxiety. Get a lot of parents going, 
are they actually going to pass their GCSE maths? At least that's in my case. They're really nervous. They want the best for their kids. Let's show them how we can do that. Uh, yeah, parents will use you for their second child a few years later. I definitely get that. Uh, siblings, cousins, friends, connections like that. So those are my big ones. I think they kind of summarize most of what we've said in there. Uh, so how do we do it? How do you connect with parents? I'd love to hear your suggestions on this one. How do you make a good connection with the parents as well as the child? Giving them gin has been very well received. Sure, why not? Um, not where I was going with that one. Um, but yeah, you can make a, a gift or a, uh, something personal at Christmas time at uh, key points. Um, that would do social media by showcasing what we're doing, half term reports, a phone call with them and listen to their worries for the child. Um, yeah, there's some really great uh, ideas. Um, one of the best ones I ever heard from a, uh, a fellow tutor was that they treat their onboarding call, and that could be a visit or a video call, any of those, um, depending on your situation, as a three-way interview. So it's not just can you work with the student, can you work with the parent? As we've already said, some parents can be trickier. Are they a parent that you can work with? Do you need to have extra things in place to be able to work with that parent? Now, that's not saying that all parents are going to be tricky and all parents are going to be hard. But if you have that sort of onboarding call, you can prepare yourself for what's coming. If you know that parent is going to be tricky. Um, we've got, yeah, so an initial Zoom call with both the parent and the child in an open question and answer and a summary of each session. Uh, to both parent and child and a zoom call progress update so at some point an update uh, there's definitely a few short email reports uh, i use tutorbird as my uh management system for doing invoices and stuff it allows me to send uh, a report as i click their attendance so at the end of the lesson i can just stick it in this is what we did today this is what they did well this is what we need to work on and I can send it to parent, I can send it to parent and child, depends on the situation. Um, an admin email long before they had an admin to send stern, <laughs> sorry, admin says no emails. It takes away some of the personalizing this in that situation, doesn't it? Uh, if it's coming from admin at rather than Helen at. Um, yeah, so that's a good one. Uh, you could have frequently asked questions on your website. You could have welcome packs. Um, it's also a great one in terms of being able to point parents to those rather than having to answer the questions yourself every time, especially if you've got larger uh, companies. If you have a frequently asked question or a welcome pack, ah, it says it on page seven of the welcome pack. Or if you have a look at my frequently asked questions, the answer is there. It saves you a whole lot of back and forth. These are the frequently asked questions. These are the details in the welcome pack. Go and have a look at those. And if the question's not in there, then you can answer it. Um, but it can give them a level of uh, confidence in you. You've got these questions, you're experienced, you know the questions they're going to ask. Uh, T's and C's right from the beginning. Yes, actually, they have to tick my T's and C's as soon as they sign up. Um, they can't get around it. So your T's and C's, your terms and conditions can sort of form part of your frequently asked questions. Um, you'd probably keep it more relaxed. Um, the T's and C's might be more legally um, about, for example, cancellation but you can have a more relaxed, frequently asked questions. Cancellation is this. It's a little bit more relaxed than the actual legalese, but it can be a really great way of connecting with parents. Um, we've talked about this quick voice note or a report. So as I said, I use Tutorbird for an email report. I know people that do voice notes. And in fact, I do it with some of my students. Um, we have a WhatsApp group for the parent, the student and myself. And I can send a little voice note at the end of the session or at the end of a series of sessions, if you'd prefer, uh, just to let them know how you got on together. So it can be really good to keep the parent up to date with where you are. They might not understand the progress. They might not understand the scheme of work of where you're going. But if you can keep them up to date, then they know exactly where their child is. And that can reassure them. It reduces that parental anxiety. 
Um, feedback requests, those delightful Google reviews or Facebook reviews or whatever method you use for reviews and feedback, if you've got a good connection, then it definitely feels more comfortable to ask for feedback, ask for those reviews. They're gonna form our social media proof. Uh, so if you are on social media, some of your posts can be, this parent said this, this child said that. That can all come via those feedback requests. You ask them how you're doing, they will let you know what's working and what's not working. And then it's up to you whether you can adjust your tuition for generally or for a specific child. You've got a lot of options there, but if you've got a good relationship, a good connection with the parent, it's definitely more comfortable. Um, Note here, don't take it personally if you are not the right choice for a child. It's okay in that onboarding or initial contact to say, actually, I don't think I'm the right choice for your child. I don't think this is gonna, I'm not gonna be able to support them in the way that you need. You wanna work with the right students for you, your niche, your age group, your subject, your target audience, you wanna work with them. It's also okay for them to come back and say, actually, this isn't working out for us. It's not the right connection. It's not a personal thing. Don't take it personally. And I know that sounds so hard to say because we do take it personally when uh, something's not working out. Um, don't, if you can, can. It just means that there's a different fit for that student. You want to work with the ones that are best for you, the ones that fit what you are wanting to work with, your ideal customer. Um, hopefully, those onboarding calls, those initial calls and contacts will reduce the amount that, that say no. Um, you'll be able to identify them early on, but it's okay to have no's. I know it feels like you wanna fill every hour in the day um, if you can, but the right students for you will come along. Don't feel pressured into taking one that's not your ideal customer. It's okay that you're not the right choice for them or you're not, or they're not the right choice for you. Make sure I get that the right way around. Uh, anyone got any thoughts on any of those? Anyone going to put anything in that they're not already doing in those? Nothing yet. There we go. Parents can and will choose a tutor that they feel a rapport with. It comes down, and this is a big marketing thing. It's not just a tuition industry thing. People get to know you. They get to like you. They get to trust you. They then buy from you. More generally. So it's not just that you... Uh, so, yeah, part of your social media, part of your marketing, all of that sort of idea, get them to know you. Put a little bit of yourself in your social media posts. Uh, I work with Helen Dickman at Love Mondays Club, um, and her thing is always put your face on. And you'll see it in nearly all my social media stuff. My face is on it. It's the same two or three pictures that I use. But it means that when they actually come to me, they know what I look like. This is a face. They can decide whether it's a nice face or not. But they know who I am, not a company name, not a company logo, though those are both good things to have if you can. Who am I? Who will it be that's teaching their child? So once they get to know you, once they get to like you, when they trust that you are able to do what they need you to do, then they'll buy. They need to feel that rapport that you are the person that can fix their problem, which is getting their child the support that they need. So that's a really um, key thing. Parents don't understand the tuition industry very well, most of them. Parents understand school. Students are not stuck with a tutor that they don't connect with. They can move to a different tutor. Um, if you have got a classroom teacher at school that the student doesn't connect with, there's nothing you can do really, apart from try and support that student through it, put in interventions where you can. Whereas tuition, you have choice. Parents have choice as to which tutor they use. And there are different tutors that have different styles that are gonna fit different students. It's absolutely fine that somebody goes with one tutor and not you, or you have somebody that somebody else wanted to work with. That's okay. We are all in it together. We're all collaborators. We will all have ideal students that we wanna work with and those that aren't. So it's it's really useful one to be able to uh, 
to understand when we're looking at how we sell ourselves. And I know it's the squirmy bit we don't like doing. We're educators in most cases. We're not business people in most cases. So this ele element of getting parents to know us, to like us and to trust us can be really key in selling ourselves uh, as tutors. Um, seems a lot of people loving the voice note idea. Um, some parents I don't hear from until their child is unwell. Yeah, sometimes actually the parents have handed over their tuition uh, and take, kind of take a step back. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Make it clear to your parents, to the parents, your values, the how and why your teaching approach. Um, I get flowers and chocolate cakes after exams. I like that. Um, there we go. Somebody hates voice notes. That's fine. <laughs> you can hate voice notes. You don't have to use them. You can do an email version instead if you would prefer. It's up to you what works for you and your child. Now, I'm definitely an email person, not a voice note person, but I do know that I've got parents and children that have ADHD and they're not going to read an email, whereas they will listen to a voice note. So it's a bit of give and take there. What works for you? Can you accommodate the need? Um, how do you deal with the parent situation where there's a lot of regular slots they can't make and agree in advance? I would go to the parent and say, is this working for you? Um, because there's a lot of slots that are being missed um, and I can't hold them open would be potentially a phrase, um, particularly if it's if it's short notice cancellations and you're still getting paid, then they're paying for something they're not accessing. So I'd be raising it then that way. You're paying for something you're not able to access. Is this working for you or do we need to find a different time or can I recommend another tutor if this isn't this isn't working? Um, if it's lots of long term. Um, regular slots that they're missing and they're cancelling with enough notice, then I would be potentially putting it in my terms and conditions that only one or two cancellations per term. Um, and then going back and saying, look, you agreed to make most of these tuition sessions. Um, illness happens. We know illness happens. It happens to us as tutors as well as children, especially younger children. Pro schools are like incubators for snot and colds and flu and all that sort of stuff you know there are going to be sessions that get missed um so but if it's happening regularly i'd be going to the parents saying i don't think this is working what do you feel again if you go to that connection um if you've built the relationship with them then that's an easier conversation to have uh, i have three concurrent lesson cancellation opens your slot for the waiting list that's a phrase you could use uh, i like that if you miss three option three cancellations or three on a row or three in a term then it opens your slot it, it allows you some some wiggle room you don't have to hold to it you can say it's at your discretion um but there you go that's that's an option um there we go uh, i'm gonna move on just because i'm aware of the time and i know i can talk for england um and probably will um connection with tutors I asked a fellow tutor why we connected, why we connect with the tutors. And in her words, most of them are nice. Some of them are useful. Some of them are, uh, sorry, most of them are nice. Lots of them are useful. Some of them are very entertaining. And I hope that that wasn't a pointed rock at me being very entertaining. Um, yeah, there are going to be tutors out there that you don't connect with. And that's fine. It might just be that you're not a good fit to, <laughs> to work with at different personalities. That's OK. Most of us are lovely. Most of us are willing to be very helpful if we can, useful. Asking the uh, questions of other tutors allows us to be able to get some answers. And some of them are very entertaining. Um, Georgina and I, who is on the call, uh, the amount of interesting text messages that go between us and when we're mucking about, um, we have a bit of a laugh. And actually, I don't think we'd have met without connecting as tutors first. Um, and this is one that doesn't always sort of twig for tutors. We're so used to um, being in school and then we come out of school or come out of a workplace and we're on our own. Um, it can be a really weird scenario. Um, so this is why it's important to connect with other tutors. Um, support and community. You aren't the first tutor. You won't be the last tutor to struggle with something. Every tutor has been new at some point. Every tutor has been full and wondering what they do next. Every tutor at some point has a challenging student or parent that they want to tear their hair out over or a situation that they don't understand. That's fine. We're, <laughs> we're not going to, especially when you start out, but even as you grow, there are going to be situations that you have come across that you've never dealt with before, but somebody else probably has. 
And that's why connecting with other tutors provides a community, provides a support. Uh, we don't have that staff room if you're from a teaching background. You don't have the water cooler, to use the American phrase, the staff room, the, the canteen, the place to go where you can talk with others. We don't have that. And unless you're part of a larger agency as a tutor, it's much, much harder to get support. There is a note in here, GCSE question they can't do. If you've got a question that you can't figure out the answer to, you can go and ask another tutor. Somebody's going to know the answer. In that community, people can recommend resources, tools, things that we can use uh, to be able to grow. Um, tutor birds uh, is one. I didn't know about it. I used to do my invoices by edit, uh, Excel. It took me forever. Um, fantastic resource. Great one. Um, yeah, so that it's it, you can ask. It's okay to ask. Does anyone have a better way of doing this? Um, anyone got a faster way of doing this? Because we don't want to waste our time. You can ask those. Um, so there you go. That's a, a really useful one. Um, tutors in your um, area and those not in your area. Um, as we said, someone to listen. Someone's usually been there first. Somebody to moan at when you've had that student that is a real pain in the butt because they happen. Or if your brain is just not braining, you're having one of those days, you just need to vent at somebody. Within connecting with other tutors, you can find tutors that are sort of on your wavelength and you can have that space. It's not that you're going to do it to everybody. Not every tutor needs to know. But if you can find the tutors that you connect with that uh, you can vent to, that you've got uh, some space, somebody you can listen to you, somebody that can tell you you're being a muppet, somebody can tell you that's, that's a really good idea, somebody that can encourage uh, tutors that can inspire you with new ideas or you can collaborate with. Um, Arthur Moore, who did a spotlight a couple of weeks ago, and I released a video series of GCSE Tough Questions um, th today. We collaborated together. So there's some fantastic uh, things and reasons to collaborate with each other. Uh, and a final one, referrals to and from other tutors. Uh, I wouldn't have a clue about teaching the 11 plus, not a dicky bird, not my subject. Um, but um, I know that there is at least one in the room, if not more. I know three or four really useful um, 11 plus tutors. And if someone came to me and said, Helen, who would you recommend? I'd be telling them then. Sorry, Richard, you would be on that list, uh, just in case you were worried. Um, I've had referrals from other tutors, science tutors that said, Helen's great at maths. I've taught other tutors kids. Now that's a terrifying one. <laughs> when you are teaching other tutors kids, um, they know who to go to. They know who the best tutors are, the tutors that are gonna fit their styles. So, and again, it's not that you, that every tutor is gonna be a good fit, but you can refer to other tutors, which is a fantastic way of getting more income. Uh, and getting other things. Uh, so hopefully today you feel a little bit better, more connected to me as a tutor uh, with the wacky stuff at the beginning and also with what I've been saying today. I hope that that's a helpful one. Um, we've got, hold on, Ella and Claire, I'm going to get there in a second. <laughs> Give me just a moment um, for my last one. Uh, Lucy, Tutorbird is off the top of my head, I think it's £12 a month for an individual tutor. And I like to think about it if my hourly rate of tuition is 40 pounds and I'm doing that because it's a nice round number. If it saves me more than, if it does what I need it to do and I don't have to spend more than a quarter of an hour doing it, it's saved me money. I can open up the time to tutor instead. Um, so it, I, it's definitely worth it. it. Even automates your in, invoices. Mine went out this morning without me having to touch them. So definitely worth it. And I believe they might be a partner of the TTA. Have a look, they were at the conference in October. Uh, so there we are. Uh, so where can you connect with other tutors? Just finally, there are TTA events. There are regional and community hubs. I know I was at Oxford's recently because um, I'm in the Southwest and I connected the Southwest one. Georgina is in the room. She runs an East of England one. Um, the regional one Oxford was central. I know there is one that's been running earlier today further up north. Um, there are lots of them. Most of them are online, so even if you're not in that area, you can join in. There are Facebook groups that are fantastic. Uh, Richard, <laughs> who's hosted the call, uh, has grow your tutoring business. Uh, Georgina is in the call, tutors need tutors. Not that they are fighting against each other, you can join both, that's absolutely fine. Uh, there's the 
Tutors Learning Networks, another one. Uh, Michael Given from the US has got Tutor and Business Success Support. The pictures are there. They're fantastic. There are other tutoring communities available. Uh, there are local meetups, not just the TTA ones. Obviously, they're awesome, but there are other ones. I've run one in Bath because I'm that kind of area. Um, so I know that there are other ones. Um, and there are subject specific groups. And now this is my tiny little plug. Um, I have just started a maths hub. So if you are a maths tutor and want to connect with other maths tutors, share your resources, uh, get access to other people to talk to each other about maths, answer those stinky GCSE questions, um, that's running once a month. Um, I will put in the chat uh, in a minute the link for that if you want to sign up for more information. Uh, no obligation, no paying or anything for the moment. You can just find out and get the emails. Um, thank you, Claire. Not that you're at all biased. Um, Claire's been, Georgina's been. It's, it's a great space. Um, so, yeah, uh, Twinkle was another great Facebook group that was mentioned. Georgina's put in the link for the community hubs um, in there. So there's uh, some fantastic um, places to be able to connect. Um, there we go. I've finished wittering. I finished wittering. Um, if you want to connect with me, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. Um, you can book in for a cuppa and chat for about half an hour. Um, and then I will also put the link in for my Maths Hub. Uh, the next two are 22nd of May, 10 till 11 a.m. Uh, and then we have a special guest. Uh, Johnny Hall from MathSpot is joining us on Friday, the 28th of June in the morning at 9.15. Um, which that's going to be really exciting. Um, but there we go. I'll put the links in the chat in a second and I will hand back to Richard and take a breath. Yeah, and breathe. Well done, Helen. Thank you so much. That was love it. Yeah, you really love that. But it's really, really informative and really interesting. What what I love about these sessions is particularly attending them live is that you take me well, me particularly, I take notes and I go back and think, well, what what's the what are the always come back to what what are the three biggest things? And I, I wrote down that that checking in at the start of a tuition session, that connection with the young person or the child. Uh, I, I ran a nurture groups in school and uh, that's how we started every nurture group session. And it was such a good way to connect. And that's something which I've lost actually in tuition. So that was a really good reminder. So I really appreciate that. And uh, that really helped shift. I, I, I wrote down like manage the mood and shift the positivity. And I think that's what it used to do in nurture group. And I, and I know we probably do do a bit of a check-in really informally. I'm going to make more of a point of it. The other thing you mentioned was like creating safe spaces. Uh, yeah. the, I've got a question here. Like, so you, you, you actually kind of definitely touched on this, but what would you say would be the most important thing from an environmental perspective to create a safe space? As in like the room or the space that they're room, yourself, in. like yeah, what what would you think would be like like on the top of that list? Or can it be can it be put out like that? I don't know if it's just, just gonna be one one thing. And I think it's gonna differ mm. depending on the student and depending on the scenario. Um I, I always like the idea of less clutter. Don't have too much stuff around you so that you're not distracted mm. by that. Don't look at my desk right now because that's do as I say, not as I do. Um, it's a complete bomb. And is it the right hill? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can see this side. You can't see that side of my camera because yeah. it's a complete mess. Um, but for them as well, as a student, yeah. they're learning. Um, and if you're in an in person situation, um, if you uh, are in a uh, either a property or people come to you, try not to have too much around. Some is great, some is inspiring, that's fantastic, but not overdoing it. Um, the online, obviously, I've had students that uh, online, especially if you're doing alternative provision work and if you're in that environment, I've had students that won't go on camera. Mm. And that's what they need to be able to engage. Mm. I've had students that do it in their pyjamas. I mean, covered, decent, not safeguarding level of pyjamas, but <laughs> keeping camera here. So... Um, <laughs> Some of them might be all about the lighting and the camera. I get it. I'm getting this. You're painting a good picture. It's good. Um, but yeah, some if okay. you've got the students that can't engage, then it's a, mm. it's a different environment to an, a student that's keen and pushing on further. So I think it's 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 different for every student. But mm. um, I'm big on the not too much clutter, not too much going on. I like that because what you've kind of put put out there is 
uh, you're, you're meeting the child at their at their point of need, whatever it may be, you know, whether it is like, yeah, we probably all would prefer if it was online cameras on, but if they're not ready for that, you can still do it. You can still, you can still access what you need to access and we can uh, maybe tackle that further down the road, without a yeah. doubt. The last thing on my list was asking for feedback. I think this is, that's golden. Go and ask your parents for feedback. I mean, you have to be really brave and you're 100% right about it's not taking really it. Pants wetting to ask the yeah. question. Yeah. Oh. First time is terrifying because you hope you're doing a good job, but mm. if the parent comes back and says that it's all terrible, the parent's probably not going to come back and say it's all terrible. Um, they're probably not, but it's just, a, it's a squirmy feeling. To, it might be a little thing that you don't realise. Yeah, absolutely. And it might be that they turn back and say, actually, um, we didn't mention it at the start. Johnny has just come in from football. Can we have a bit more warming up time? Yeah. Fantastic. Now I know that I can accommodate it. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, you might find yeah. somebody's software is struggling if you're an online one. Um, mm. Claire's just put in the chat, asking for feedback and references for the TTA awards left her glowing, but she wouldn't have asked wouldn't have known if she hadn't asked yeah and yeah i'm with you on that one having to ask for references for the tta awards is probably the most nerve-wracking bit apart from the weight that's nerve-wracking um but yeah waiting to hear what these parents are going to say and actually every time it's come back it's been lovely mm. and it's and that's and then that's your social media proof you take a snippet a short line in fact my social media today for the company business for the osmond education stuff was a quote from somebody that sent in a reference. I took two lines out of it and used that as my social media. And provided you've got permission to use it, mm. absolutely fine. And you can anonymize it if your parent doesn't want to know, doesn't want to be identified, that's fine. Mm. You can do that. But yeah, there were some really, I was like, oh, that's sweet kind of reaction. I mean, slightly less squeaky than that, but it was, it was lovely to read some. And actually the impact that you're having, you don't always realize the impact you're having on your student. Mm. Yeah, it was fascinating. I, I, I yeah, lo love the whole the whole hour. Has anybody else got any questions? Anything they want to want to share and um, feel free to off mute and yeah, uh, ask. Silence. I know. Yeah, it's that awkward bit. Like you said earlier on, it's like right. Let's wait just to see. Yeah, great, brilliant. Thank you. Yes. Right, okay we'll we'll leave it there helen thank you so much we really appreciate it and um if you're watching on on replay then i'm sure these links will be made available to you as well uh you did a really good job at making sure anybody who put something in the chat was read out loud Helen. that was really good um but they might not have access to the link so we'll make sure the links are shared we'll we'll get that sorted by um I'll, I'll let sam know um, right, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for turning up live. We really appreciate it. And we will all see you all super soon. See you all soon. Thank yeah, you. Later.